Since we're studying the book of Philippians, I thought it would be appropriate today for us to go to Acts chapter 16 and learn about how the church at Philippi got started. The story is all right here in Acts chapter 16. If you have your Bible open, I want you to look back just for a few minutes at chapter 15. Towards the end of Acts chapter 15, Paul and Barnabas had just returned to Antioch from the famous council in Jerusalem where they had defended their doctrinal position that Gentile believers did not have to be circumcised in order to be saved. It was a huge, huge victory for what we would call Gentile evangelism. Along with Paul and Barnabas, the church in Jerusalem also sent Judas and also Silas back to Antioch to verify and to confirm the council's decision. After some time had lapsed, Paul and Barnabas decide to take another missionary trip. I want you to look now at Acts chapter 15 and verse 36. Notice these words. And some days after, Paul said unto Barnabas, Let us go again and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord and see how they do. But Paul and Barnabas had a disagreement as to whether to take John Mark with them or not. So they parted ways. Paul took Silas with him and Barnabas took John Mark with him. And so taking Silas, Paul set out on his second missionary journey. When the two of them got to Lystra, Timothy joined them. Paul's plan was then to retrace his steps of, of his first missionary journey and to go back and to encourage all the churches that had been planted. But the Bible says in Acts chapter 16 and verse 6 that while they were in Galatia, notice what the Bible says, they were forbidden of the Holy Ghost to preach the word in Asia. No doubt Paul was wanting to go to the, the city of Ephesus and preach the gospel, but the Holy Spirit said no. So they decided to go to Bithynia. But again, the Bible says, look at it in Acts chapter 16, verse 7, but the Spirit suffered them not. And so according to Acts chapter 16 and verse 8, Paul and Silas and Timothy were in somewhat of what I would call a holding pattern in a city called Troas. It was while they were there in Troas that Dr. Luke joined their team. You say, how do you know that Dr. Luke joined their team in Troas? Well, keep in mind that it was Luke who is writing the book of Acts. Up until this point in the narrative, as you read it, Dr. Luke used the word they. But in verse 10, he begins to use the word we. And so suddenly he went from they, that would be Paul and Silas and Timothy traveling together, to suddenly he uses the word we. In other words, he joins the team while they were there in Troas. It was in Troas that God gave Paul what we call the Macedonian vision. I want you to see it in Acts chapter 16. I want to read verse 9 and verse 10. And a vision appeared to Paul in the night. There stood a man of Macedonia and prayed him saying, Come over into Macedonia and help us. And after he had seen the vision, immediately, notice that word again, we, Luke is part of the team now, we endeavor to go into Macedonia, assuredly gathering that the Lord had called us for to preach the gospel unto them. Notice that once God's will was revealed, Dr. Luke says, immediately we endeavored to go into Macedonia. Isn't that the way it ought to be for each one of us? You say, what are you talking about? I'm talking about this. When we know what God wants us to do, we should immediately endeavor to do it. When we don't know what he wants us to do, we're in a holding pattern. Notice that God uses a principle 
Bible called opening doors and closing doors here for Paul. He was closing some doors and while those doors were being closed, Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke there in Troas, they were in a holding pattern. They were in what I would call God's waiting room. They were waiting for God's will to be revealed. What was God's plan? They didn't know. But as soon as God revealed that plan to them, the Bible says they immediately endeavored to do it. And so Paul and Silas and Timothy and Dr. Luke, they go to the town of Philippi. As you read the book of Acts, you quickly learn that when Paul would first go into a city, his custom was to go to the synagogue. That's where he went first. He'd go to the synagogue and he would share the gospel with the Jewish population of that city. You keep in mind Paul's philosophy of ministry to the Jew first and then to the Greek. So every time he would go into a city where he would begin evangelizing that city with the gospel, he would head straight to the synagogue and he would begin to share Jesus Christ with the Jews. After all, he was a rabbi and he had studied under the greatest rabbi of that day and his name was Gamaliel. Jewish people would come to listen to Paul even if they did not agree with him. But because Paul does not go here in Acts chapter 16 to a synagogue in Philippi, I think we can safely assume that there wasn't a synagogue in Philippi. History tells us that in order to have a synagogue in a city, there had to be at least 10 Jewish men representing 10 different households. So the Jewish population of Philippi must have been so, so small because a synagogue had not even been built yet. Often when there wasn't an actual synagogue to meet in, the Jewish community would get together on the Sabbath and they would meet somewhere in an open area, maybe under a tree or maybe uh, near a river. I'll, I'll never forget when I was over visiting Tanzania many years ago and uh, we went out to a, an area called Basodesh. That was the name of the town. There is a uh, national pastor there named Pastor John who is ministering faithfully. And I remember Steve uh, telling us we got to see his, his building there, the small church building that they had. But Steve said before there was ever a building, he took me over and he said, they used to meet underneath this tree. <laughs> Here was a tree and they said, this is where the church would meet. Well, Back in this day and time, it was the same way. If there was no building, if there was no synagogue, then what did they do? Well, they would often meet under a tree or maybe down near a river. Well, the one here in Philippi was located outside of the gate of the city is what the Bible says. Outside of the gate of the city in verse 13, and it was down by the riverside. It was the Sabbath. And so Paul and Silas and, and Timothy and Luke, they make their way to this location outside of the walls of the city, down by the riverside, where they had heard that there would be a prayer meeting and some people to gather there for that prayer meeting. Now, what's interesting is, is when they get there, they find a group of women who are worshiping there. There was one woman, though, that stood out among all the other women, and that was a Gentile woman named Lydia. We've all read this story about Lydia. Look at it, please, in Acts 16, verse 14. And a certain woman named Lydia, a seller of purple of the city of Thyatira, which worshiped God, heard us, whose heart the Lord opened, and she attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. Now, Lydia becomes the first recorded person to become a Christian in Europe. She was from the city of Thyatira, a site, uh, by the way, of one of the seven churches of Asia Minor that is mentioned in Revelation chapter 2. No doubt she had traveled that road, the Via Ignatia. She had traveled that road to get to the city of Philippi. Thyatira was known for manufacturing goods that were dyed, especially with the color purple. 
Clothes were dyed purple, and by the way, they were very expensive clothes, and they were pretty much worn only by the wealthy and by royalty. And so Lydia must have been a very successful businesswoman. Uh, she had a profitable business, business with, with the aristocrats of Philippi. I believe the fact that Lydia had even a, a house big enough to accommodate this missionary team. Keep in mind there were four of them. She accommodated this missionary team as well as the new church there in the city of Philippi was launched from Lydia's home. And so she must have been fairly well to do financially. I want you to notice several things about this first convert named Lydia. I want to give you several points to write down. Number one, the Bible says here that she was a worshiper of God. She was a worshiper of God. Now keep in mind that the Greeks were polytheistic. You say, what does it mean to be polytheistic? It means that they believed in the multiplicity of gods. They didn't believe that there was just one God. They believed that there were many gods. They didn't believe that there was a, a one God only to worship, but that there were many gods that ought to be worshiped. But Lydia Lydia must have come at some point in time in her life, had come to the realization that all the different deities of the Greek culture were all false. She had come to the place where she had rejected the worship of idolatry. She believed that there was only one true living God. And so she identified with the Jewish community, which would have been monotheistic. Number two, the Bible says she carefully listened to Paul as he shared the gospel. No doubt as this small group of women would meet Sabbath after Sabbath, they would maybe study the Old Testament scriptures together. Now I'm going to use my imagination just for a moment, but I can just see them gathering down by the riverside. And, and they're getting comfortable, they're sitting around, and maybe they begin to discuss the Old Testament passage of Isaiah chapter 53. And they begin to read that passage, and they begin to talk about that passage, and they begin to wonder who the prophet Isaiah was talking about. Well, in God's sovereignty, one day Paul shows up at their exact location. Imagine that. They're, they're down there meeting, just like they always do on the Sabbath. And suddenly, four strangers show up. Paul, Silas, and Timothy, and also Dr. Luke. And in God's sovereignty, they show up at that exact location outside the city wall, down by the riverside, and they begin to tell them about Jesus, who is the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophecy. Notice verse 14 where it says, She attended unto the things which were spoken of Paul. That means Lydia paid careful attention to everything Paul was saying. I pray that you are paying attention right now. I'm sure there's a lot of distractions there in your living room or in your kitchen there at the table. I don't know, maybe you're even scrolling down your phone right now. Pay attention. Lydia was paying attention to what Paul was communicating. It's very possible that she had never ever heard about Jesus. It's quite possible that she had never heard about what Jesus had accomplished on the cross of Calvary. But needless to say, for the first time, it all made sense. It was like somebody hit the switch and, and the light came on. Yes, there was only one true God. That was affirmed in her mind. But he had sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, into the world to be born of a virgin. He had lived a perfect and a sinless life. He had bled and he had suffered and he had died for her sins upon the cross. He was buried but then he conquered death with his glorious resurrection. The reality of her need of Jesus suddenly hit her like a ton of bricks. That brings me to my third point. God opened her heart that day and she received Jesus Christ as her personal savior. 
When it comes to evangelism, our job is to just faithfully and clearly present the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's our job. Week after week as I speak, I, I'm trying to faithfully communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that many of you as members of Canton Baptist Temple, when you, when you talk to others throughout the week, when you have God-given opportunities, you try to faithfully and clearly and simplistically and powerfully share the gospel of Jesus Christ with others. You see, we do our job, and then it's God's job to do the convicting and to do the saving. You and I can't save anybody, <laughs> We can't do that. Only God saves. People aren't saved by the power of our persuasion. You say, well, I wasn't able to convince him to receive Christ. No, no, we don't, we don't have the power to persuade or to force somebody to get saved. Evangelism is not the ability to win an argument or to try to manipulate someone into making a spiritual decision. By the way, we don't even have to be theologians to lead people to Christ. We just need to take advantage of the opportunities that God gives us to share Jesus with others. Again, we see the sovereignty of God at work. God had brought Paul all the way across the Aegean Sea so that Lydia and her family could hear a clear presentation of the gospel and so that they could get saved. We need to get to the place in our Christian lives where we realize there are no accidents. There's only divine appointments. By the way, maybe you're just tuning in here uh, to this online worship service here at Canton Baptist Temple today. Maybe you're new to our ministry. You'd never heard of us and maybe somehow you saw it on Facebook or something. I want you to know if you're watching today, you're not watching by accident. You're watching by divine appointment. God has a reason. God has a plan. God has a purpose for it. You see, Lydia was seeking the truth. And Paul was looking for people to share that truth with. And God put them together. Isn't that the way it always works? Somebody seeking and then somebody with the truth. God puts those two together in his sovereignty. And that's what he did right here in Philippi. My friend, I believe that people still are seeking the truth even today. But often we as Christians are not faithful to share Jesus Christ with others. Make a commitment today. If you are a Christian, if you're a born-again believer in Christ, a committed follower of Jesus Christ, I want to encourage you today, take advantage of the God-given opportunities to share Christ with others. We have those opportunities week in and week out. Fourthly, Lydia and her household immediately followed the Lord in believer's baptism. Baptism always comes after salvation. Notice that she opened her heart to the Lord in verse 14. Notice that. She got saved in verse 14. But then she was baptized in verse 15. I repeat, always in the New Testament you find this order. And that is, there's salvation then baptism. Baptism always comes after salvation. Baptism doesn't save a person. Can I remind you of Romans chapter 10 and verse 9? Because here in Acts chapter uh, 16, and uh, we see in verse 14 that Lydia, whose heart the Lord opened. I want you to think about that word heart and then listen to Romans chapter 10 verse 9. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine, what's the word? Heart. That God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. With the heart man believeth unto salvation. A person is saved by God's grace through faith in Jesus Christ, plus nothing and minus nothing. After a person is saved, then they get baptized. Baptism is a matter of obedience, following the Lord in believer's baptism. No one can get saved by being baptized. Baptism doesn't save a person. 
But rather we are saved when with our heart we put our trust, our faith in Christ alone. We believe on Jesus Christ and then he saves us. Fifthly, after being saved and baptized, Lydia wanted to be used of the Lord in his service. You know, the old adage is still true, we're saved to serve. (laughs) When God saved you, he didn't save you just so you could sit around until you die or until uh, he comes back for his church at the rapture. No, no, he didn't save you just so you could uh, sit and do nothing. No, no, God saved us so that we will then in turn give our life to him and serve him faithfully. And that's why Lydia here opened her home to not only accommodate Paul and his team, but to launch a local church in the city of Philippi. Get the picture here. Lydia says, wow, I'm saved now. I want to do something for the Lord. And she says, where are you guys staying right now? I'd love to accommodate you. You come stay at our house. And then the more they talk, she said, Well, I'm willing to utilize my house to try to uh, start a church right here in the city of Philippi. You see, she and her family would later become charter members of the church at Philippi. But as we all know, spiritual victory is almost always met with spiritual opposition. Did you hear that? Almost every time, you can count on it, that spiritual victory is met with spiritual opposition. If you read on down in this story here in Acts chapter 16, a young girl who was demon-possessed began to harass and, and to give Paul grief day after day, just following around Paul and the team and giving them a hard time. Finally, Paul got tired of it, and he cast the demon out of her. And you might hear that statement and go, praise the Lord, what a victory. Well, there was only one problem. The young girl was a slave. And not just to one master, the Bible says here twice, it says, her masters, plural. They were using her for financial gain by having the demonic spirit within her foretell people's futures. But when their financial gain was gone, her masters got upset. And in verse 19, look at Acts 16, verse 19, the Bible tells us that they caught or they seized Paul and Silas and they took them to the magistrates who then had them arrested, had them beaten, and then had them put into prison. You know the rest of the story. (laughs) What a great, great story. This is an amazing story about how the church of Philippi got started. There they are, Paul and Silas, sitting in prison. They were bruised and they were bleeding from getting beaten earlier. And Paul and Silas began to sing praises to God. And then suddenly there's an earthquake. And all the prison doors swing open. And the chains fall off of the prisoners The Bible tells us that the keeper of the prison feared that all the prisoners had escaped. And so he was about to commit suicide. After all, if he could not give an account for all of the prisoners, he would have been killed anyway. So he said, you know what? I'm just going to commit suicide. Let's pick up the story in verse 28. Acts 16 beginning in verse 28. But Paul cried with a loud voice saying, do thyself no harm for we are all here. Don't kill yourself. Don't do that. We're not going to try to escape. We're all right here. Verse 29. Then he called for a light and sprang in and came trembling and fell down before Paul and Silas. No doubt he had heard them sing praise to God earlier. I wonder what songs they were singing. Uh, We have no idea. The Bible doesn't tell us, but they were singing, I guess, what we would call prison songs. (laughs) There they were singing and praising and worshiping the God who had saved them. And no doubt this keeper of the prison had heard those songs and finding out that all the prisoners were still there, he came in trembling and fell down in verse 30 and brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Wow, don't you love it when somebody asks you that question? (laughs) What do I have to do to get saved? 
Well, notice what verse 31 says. And they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved and thy house. Now notice that they did not say, you need to be baptized. Nope, that's not what they said. Also, they didn't say, well, you need to really start being a good person. You know, if you'll abide by this and this and uh, do this and do that. No, no. The Bible says, how does a person get saved? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved in thy house. Verse 32. And they spake unto him the word of the Lord and to all that were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their stripes and was baptized, he and all his, straightway. And when he had brought them into his house, he set meat before them and rejoiced, believing in God with all his house." How did the church at Philippi get started? Well, it got started down by the riverside, and it got started in a prison. <laughs> Canton Baptist Temple got started at an old German dance hall. Well, how did the church at Philippi get started? Well, down by the riverside where Lydia and her household got saved and they got baptized, I believe right there at the river. And then you've got this keeper of the prison, and his whole family, these folks became the charter members of the church at Philippi. God was at work. Folks, God is always at work, and we need to understand that. Even right now with what is going on across America and around the world, we may think that things are spinning out of control. I want you to know God is still at work. I'm praying that through this whole pandemic that, that God will draw more people to himself, that people will get saved and people will turn to him for help and for strength and for wisdom. God was at work here in Philippi raising up a church for his honor and his glory. And as we will see in our study of the book of Philippians, this church would become one of Paul's favorite churches. But as we close, can I ask you a question? A very, very important question. Have you opened your heart and received Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, just like Lydia and her household did? Just like the keeper of the prison and his household did? Has there ever been a point in time in your life when you've recognized the fact that you're a sinner in need of the Savior? And you've realized you can't save yourself. Only Jesus can save. And you, you repent of your sin and by faith you trust Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Has there ever been a point in time in your life when you made that decision like Lydia and her household, like the keeper of the prison and his household? If not, I hope that you will make that life-changing decision today.